I've talked on this channel a couple of times now about The Expanse and why it's easily been one of my favourite shows for the last five years. One thing that has stuck with me about the show is how it has managed to bring its story from page to screen whilst managing to feel somehow both distinct and faithful to the book series it is based on. Expect major spoilers for The Expanse to follow. If you've not watched it, go do that and then come back. Authors Daniel Abraham and Ty Frank, who make up the writing partnership known as James S.A. Corey and the brains behind the book series, contributed to the writer's room for the adaptation and were seemingly always aware that this had to be a different beast. As stated by Abraham, it's generally speaking a genuinely terrible idea to have writers in the writer's room because we come and say, well I wrote it like this, it should stay like that. And that's absolutely not what the process looks like when you're adapting something. So what exactly does that process look like? What changes did The Expanse have to go through to translate from book to screen? And more importantly, were those changes for the better? There are two crucial factors that have to be taken into account when adapting any property. Beyond accuracy and creative intent, these being time and budget. While the book still needs to be paced and structured correctly, there's a lot more freedom in how an author achieves that, even just in terms of page count or the time span of events covered. An on-screen adaptation, whether a full film or individual episode, must be designed, structured and paced to be watched as an individual piece of entertainment. For a television series, every episode needs to ensure that the audience has a reason to come back the moment the next episode drops, not later, since the slippery slope of later can often end up being never. But like most things in the entertainment industry, it also comes down to money. If accuracy is too expensive, then it's not going to happen, no matter how in love with the source material the people behind a production may or may not be. Look at the first season of Game of Thrones for a good example, with Tyrion experiencing the first major battle of the series in the vein of The Hobbit, at least the novelised version, unconscious with the action happening off screen. That first season had a budget of roughly $6 million per episode. By season 4's Watchers on the Wall, the show now had a budget of $15 million per episode. Back in season 1, that battle simply wasn't financially feasible, at least not without sacrificing something else. It becomes a question for production on what's more important, spectacle or substance. In that vein, one such decision that the creators behind The Expanse had to make early on was the appearance of the Belters. They are described in the original books as being incredibly tall and skinny due to growing up in low to zero G. I guess that's from generations in low G, huh? Someday, see every Belter is gonna look just like that. But realistically, a production is going to struggle to find enough actors who look that way naturally, especially to fill the amount of roles that would need filling. Using VFX to transform the eventual actors into book accurate belters would cost huge amounts of both money and production time. While a movie might be able to do something of this scale, it's out of the question for a television series with a smaller budget spread out over an overall longer runtime. So out of the gate, the belters can't really look like belters. Even techniques like the forced perspective used by Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings would be far too restrictive overall for the type of show The Expanse was set up to be. Even the Martians are still meant to be taller than Earthers, with Bobby Draper in the books being described as being over 2 metres tall. Game of Thrones got lucky with finding the 6 foot 3 Gwendon and Christie to portray the towering Brienne of Tarth, but unfortunately Christie can't play everyone. Regarding the matter, Abraham wrote on his official website, We were involved in the decision to not require that every belter be tall and skinny. It was the right choice. The pool of actors, especially of women over 6'2", is really quite small and by having a wider group to select from we got to prioritise things like chemistry and charisma, acting chops and similarity of personality to the character from the book. If we get a great actor, people will quickly forget that they're not quite as tall as their book counterpart. If we get a bad actor, no amount of height will save the performance. The solution is to show the different evolution of the belters in other ways, by showing different physical traits that set them apart, giving them a distinct visual style and way of talking. What about you? What about me? What's your tell? Let me help you with that, and your Loda. This one. He has spurs at the top of his spine where the bones didn't fuse right. He got that cheap bone density juice when he was a child, probably a ward of the station. So even if he disguises himself, he's just like me. Stay calm, and everything will be okay. No, not like this. Stay calm. Unte golden gon your good. Stay calm. Hands be. And when you talk in and before is we. While this may not be as visually striking as the book set up the belters to be, 
it still accomplishes the same ultimate goal. And anyway, as Abraham also points out, Belters are supposed to be diverse in their language, their culture, their politics, their modes of dress, and yeah, in their bodies. Which is to say, Belters are supposed to be people. And this all ties into one of the most important parts of bringing any story to life on screen. Keeping the spirit of the original series, even if not being beholden to the details. An author has nothing but the limits of their imagination to work with when writing a book. As said by showrunner Naren Shankar during promotion for season 1, Adaptation is incredibly fun and incredibly tricky, because the task is always, I feel, to really preserve the spirit of the work. There are things that you can do in the novels that you cannot do on the screen, and I think the trick is to distill the wonderful characters and material that they have built into this incredible original story. One of the most notable decisions made in the production of The Expanse was to split the first book in the series, Leviathan Wakes, into a season and a half's worth of episodes instead of just a straight one book to one season adaptation. This involved reinterpreting a major event from the book's second half, the unleashing of the protein molecule in Eros, into something that worked as a conclusion to a season, and then tackling the book's actual climax in the first half of season two. It's an interesting decision, especially since The Viathan Wakes is already structured like an action thriller, described by io9 as as close as you'll get to a Hollywood blockbuster in book form, and almost certainly could have been told in a more straightforward manner. For comparison, The Viathan Wakes clocks in at 577 pages, and was ultimately covered in 15 episodes, while George R. R. Martin's A Game of Thrones is 694 pages and was put to screen in a 10 episode season. This season split does a lot of interesting things as a result, particularly with the characters it allows us to meet. In the novels, the perspective is normally limited to only a handful of characters per installment, and Leviathan Wakes only has two point of views, James Holden and Detective Miller. The scope of events is incredibly tight as a result, with bigger events like the war between Earth and Mars occurring mostly in the background, while we instead deep dive into Holden and Miller's corner of the story. The Expanse uses this extra time created by the split to show more of events that we sometimes only ever heard of in the books, as well as bringing future characters into the story earlier, like Christian Avasarala. She has now been a presence on the show since the very first episode, but didn't appear on page until the second book of the series, Caliban's War. In bringing Avasarala forward a season, Shankar described Frank and Abraham as being totally behind that, because what we wanted to do was dimensionalise the conflict. Having Avasarala around a season earlier gives a point of view on Earth which we didn't have before, which helps develop Earth as a setting and contextualise a lot of the action in seasons to come. Funnily enough, Abraham and Frank actually wrote episode 7 of season 1, Windmills, which featured huge amounts of original content created for the show, such as the crew of the Rocinante dealing with the stowaway, and Avasarala visiting Holden's family. Slowing down the pace of the Viathan Wakes gives the show extra time to let the characters experience and react to the world around them. According to Shankar, part of the fun of doing a show of this nature is a slower burn, because the joy of television is in allowing character moments to really breathe, and allowing the audience to spend time really getting to know people. So the fact that we have opened up the story, we've opened up an additional storyline, it's changed the pace of it, but it's actually really good. You get to know and love and spend time with the characters in the show. Going into the second season, the split also has a major advantage in making the first five episodes flow incredibly well, a non-stop trip through the climax of the Viathan Wakes. Reaching the start of Caliban's war with the season's sixth episode functions as a chance for the audience and the show both to catch their breath without resetting and slowing down the pace. This also allows both seasons to avoid a common network television trope, where exciting events and big reveals only happen towards the end of the season. The split book structure sidesteps that problem significantly. A well-structured thriller novel should have exciting and impactful moments happening throughout the story anyway, so there are plenty of moments that can be appropriately repurposed. The style continued on into season 3 before pivoting here, in a way that runs counter to the previously established structure. Similar to the previous season, the first six episodes are devoted to the climax of Caliban's War, but by comparison, the third novel in the series, Abaddon's Gate, ends up being covered in only seven episodes. According to Daniel Abraham, one of the reasons Abaddon's Gate was condensed this way was due to the singular location of the story. The show so far had spent so much time in as many locations as possible, but Abaddon's Gate as a story spends almost all its time either on the battleship Behemoth or on the Rocinante. As a half season, this isn't so much of a problem, and it helps set a very tense, almost claustrophobic stage for the already chilling events that take place beyond the ring. But at the same time, a whole season in just these few locations would risk feeling stale and unmoving, like a season on a farm. 
It's also worth mentioning that there's a very likely chance that the team behind the show knew cancellation may have been on the horizon by season 3's end. Better to end on a strong, conclusive note than end up like so many other genre shows these days with cliffhangers that will never be finished. Overall, this structure really just let the audience see more and meet different characters than they were able to in the books, offering a reason as to why you need to watch the show even if you already read The Expanse. These kind of additions also give us opportunities to explore fresh characters that readers were never able to get that close to due to the limitations of a tight point of view narrative. Especially major antagonists like Sadovir Ehrenreit and Jules Pierre Mao. More time with antagonists let them be humanised, which ties back into part of the overall spirit and core of the Expanse's narrative in general. That everyone and every side has a reason for behaving the way they do. We get to see the side of Aaron Wright that believes so powerfully in defending Earth at all costs, while we know that his actions only serve to push it closer to the brink through his war with Mars. Or witness Jules Pierre Mao confront the horrifying realities of experiments with the proto molecule after he bonds with young test subject May. We are on the verge of so much more. We're torturing children. We're creating killing machines. And we're still light years away from even beginning to comprehend that yet continues the project regardless. Again, this is something we saw a lot of in early Game of Thrones, where the show often took the opportunity to spend time with characters that we only ever saw through the point of view of a point of view character. One of the strongest scenes in that show's first season featured King Robert and Cersei Lannister having an honest, one-on-one -on -one conversation, something we would never have seen in the book due to neither of them being a point of view character, and it did so much to elevate both characters and make them more than just what we saw through Ned or the other Starks. As well as the use of tight point of views, the expanse in book form has a habit of rotating the wider cast with every instalment. The only consistent one of these for the most part is Holden, and other point of view characters like Prax Meng, Anna Volovodov and Elvia Koye tend to be only majorly relevant in a single book each. It's an interesting way to differentiate the books from each other to give each one its own style and individual narrative depending on the type of characters we're following this time. For characters like Prax, who ultimately become secondary in the greater narrative, the structural approach of splitting the books across seasons has the effect of letting them feel like they're around a lot more than they are. Prax is only supposed to be around as a major character for Caliban's War, but instead appears over two seasons, making it feel like we've spent longer with him than we technically have. Conversely, Anna only appears in season 3, but by introducing her at the start of the season and integrating her story into the back half of Caliban's War, instead of waiting for Abaddon's gate to begin, she now technically appears over two books worth of plot instead, once again making her story feel bigger and more impactful on the series as a whole. It's the same thing that the show did with Ava Sarada and again with Bobby Draper in season 2, who was also brought into the show slightly earlier in her initial appearance in Caliban's War in order to do the same. Like most of the secondary point of views, Prax and Anna are characters with an inbuilt shelf life, in their case, thanks to their characters being anchored so strongly to their families and their children. But a show can't continue to constantly recycle too many of its on-screen cast, since actor and face investment is a very big thing. A production is relying on audiences to connect with the characters on screen, an integral part of that is connecting to the actor themselves. But what happens when a cast rotation is baked into the series being adapted? One natural solution to this problem is what the writers have been doing with Avasarada and Bobby since the beginning, inventing new material for characters to do between their appearances in the novels. As an example of this, Bobby was featured in the Abaddon's Gate section of Season 3, despite not being anywhere near those events in the book, and Season 4 loosely adapted Gods of Risk, a novella that features some of what Bobby was up to between her book appearances. Another method for more secondary characters is to simply merge them, as seen most notably with Kamina Drummer. Drummer didn't initially appear until Nemesis Games, the fifth book in the series, but the show introduced her far earlier in Season 2. Portrayed by Kara G, she starts in her original role as Head of Security for Fred Johnson on Tycho Station, but then becomes a compilation of several other characters from the series. There's Engineer Sam, who originally befriended Naomi Nagata on Tycho, and the show sees Drummer and Naomi develop that friendship instead. After that, Drummer has taken on huge aspects of both Carlos Bull, C. DeBaca, and Michio Pa, both of whom are point of view characters in Abaddon's Gate and Nemesis games respectively. Losing two point of view characters seems like a big change to make, but overall it's one that makes sense. If Bull, for example, is introduced for the Abaddon's Gate storyline, he either only appears for half a season, 
or needs to be inserted earlier in the storyline, which is already having to be done with Anna in that season. Using drama requires less work on the audience's part, less characters to have to remember and invest in, and creates one strong character with a fuller arc, instead of three supporting characters who rotate in and out of the story. These decisions inevitably cause other ripple effect changes to the story as a whole, with different characters surviving and dying, and whole motivations being affected as a result. With Sam removed from the story, for example, her death in Abaddon's Gate is no longer a motivating factor for the eventual storming of the Bridge of the Behemoth, that serves as part of the novel's climax. Ironically enough, Season 5 sees the sort of reintroduction of Bull, who is now filling the supporting role Drummer should have originally had on Tycho Station during Nemesis games. It might seem a little messy from the outside, but it makes for an overall stronger arc and narrative centred around a character the writers always knew was going to have a larger role later in the series, and is one of the huge benefits of having the writers of the books collaborating on the adaptation. The original main antagonist of Abaddon's Gate, Clace Ashford, also ends up getting a lot more development due to shrinking the cast here, and shows how an adaptation can keep to the spirit of the story whilst managing to make it feel new for everyone. Since a lot of the focus in this section of Season 3 is tight on drummer, Ashford naturally slips into a role as her foil, and gets to evolve much further as a result. He has changed from the book's pencil-pushing, ego-driven character into a former pirate, the Ghost Knife of Callisto, who has become a patriot of the belt and assigned to be Drummer's EXO on the Behemoth. The point of this change is to challenge Drummer and her own ideology, not necessarily in a negative way, and to visually represent the evolving points of view of the Belters, which again, serves the spirit of the story more so than it serves the original written plot. At this point, the Belters are in the process of becoming a struggling attempt at a nation, the kind of thing that's hard to show on screen without devolving into exposition. As a result, Ashford is better used here as a manifestation of the new, evolving belt for Drummer and others to bounce off. Book Ashford served a purpose in that version of the story with that version of the characters, but show Ashford has to work differently. Long term this has plenty of interesting narrative effects, especially going into Season 5 and Drummer's ultimate role. Despite technically overwriting another character who book fans may have been looking forward to seeing on screen, Monsieur Pa, Drummer's actions are going to be much more interesting due to the time and investment that has been put into her as a single worthwhile character, and together, her and Ashford get to represent the development of the Belter state as something more tangible, showing rather than telling. How many have you space for reasons just like this? Yeah, more than I'd like to admit, but we're not pirates or rock hoppers anymore. We're citizens of the Belt. Oh, come on. And we have to start acting like members of a society that obeys the rule of law, not like the animals that the inners have always portrayed us to be. And admittedly, this is partly because the show gets to work from a very advantageous position of knowing where the books are going, and this means getting the opportunities to set up characters like Avasarada, Bobby and Drummer in ways they didn't get before. As said by Daniel Abraham, one of the things that's been really interesting is having the backstory that we kind of hid in the books come up earlier in the show. So you might end up seeing hints and parts of characters that we were a little more coy with, a little more upfront on the screen. And this concept continued into the recent fourth season, which used a lot of the tricks learned from the rest of the series to turn a very singular focused novel into something that does a lot of legwork for events yet to come. So Bowler Burn, Book 4, is arguably one of the most self-contained of the series, set almost entirely on the planet Ilus and featuring only characters present to that action, save for a prologue and epilogue that feature Avasarala and Bobby. As already established, a yearly television series is bound by different conventions and expectations to a novel, and the showrunner will find it harder to get away with leaving chunks of the cast out of the action for two years, both from the audience's point of view and from a practical sense. As well as audience attachment with the actors, there's also the reality that the actors are employees who need to work. In an interview with EW, showrunner Naren Shankar addressed the challenge of Sabola Byrne's style. So what we ended up doing is that Sabola Byrne does form the spine of the show. Book 4 extends across Season 4, but we've created material that bridges Book 4 into Book 5, so there's new material that deals with stuff that sets up things for the next season. Now, important characters like Marco Inaros and situations like the new state of the Belt and Mars all get to be introduced and given room to breathe before the big action begins in the new fifth season, based on Nemesis games. Once again, lending a greater weight to future events, while still managing the realities of television production, and it's obvious how many of these decisions have been made with the quality of the show always in mind in some form, not just practicality. The Expanse has obviously learned a lot from adaptations that have come before it, and has done its best to not let restrictions and practical issues get in the way of translating the most important elements of the story. And that's the secret, really. 
which doesn't seem like a huge reveal, but still seems to be often missed all the same. The important part isn't meticulously transporting the action from the page onto the screen, since sometimes that's not possible due to real life limitations, or even just because of the simply differing formats. Instead, the best adaptation needs to capture the core and the heart of the original work, and bring that to life on screen. Even if the details are sometimes different, The Expanse proves that it understands what made that book special to readers, and delivers on that promise. Thanks for watching. I know it's been a while since my last video, but I've got a lot of great ideas for videos to come, and look forward to sharing them with you soon. If you enjoyed this video, let me know what you think in the comments, and feel free to like and subscribe. Maybe check out some of my other content, including how hashtag save the expanse, well, save the expanse. Catch season 5 of the expanse, now available on Amazon Prime, and see you next time.